Good afternoon and welcome to the Alex webinar on library linked data. Tuning library metadata for the semantic web. I'm Kristen Martin, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee. Uh, I apologize for a few technical glitches we are having early on. Hopefully from here on out it will be smooth sailing. Our presenter today is Corey Harper. Corey has worked as the metadata services librarian at New York University since 2007. Prior to that, he was a metadata librarian and a digital library developer at the University of Oregon. He has been actively involved in the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative since 2002 and has focused his professional work on discussing semantic web technologies and linked open data principles with librarians in a variety of venues. If you have any questions for Corey, please type them into the question box on your screen and Corey will do his best to answer them during his presentation. Also, please note the session will be recorded and you will receive an email shortly after the conclusion of the webinar with a link to the recording. In addition, you will also receive a copy of Corey's slides. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Corey now and there may be a slight delay. Okay, um, this is, uh, I, I hope everyone can hear me. I can't really see raised hands, but I think I'm sounding okay and coming through. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, linked library data and a little bit about the context of RDA and how RDA can feed into linked library data and make library data work a little bit better with the semantic web, but also with the web in general which is why I've got the semantic bracketed on that slide. So an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. In the beginning, I think I'm going to make a primarily an intro to the semantic web. Um, it's going to be heavily semantic web focused and not very library data focused. And I want to introduce some terminology that will make some of the rest of the presentation make sense. I'm kind of operating under the assumption that not everyone knows very much about the linked library data or the linked data movement and the semantic web in general. Eventually though, I will move more in the direction of talking about library data and specifically about resource description and access, again, in the context of linked library data. So beyond the MARC context that we've typically been looking at RDA from, certainly through this webinar series, and really, in general, as the RDA testing and development has unfolded. But what I'm going to be talking about is linked data, RDA in the context of linked data, and the context with, of much broader, much more broad interoperability. So getting started with the semantic web and even what it is, the concept has been around really going back to the beginning of Tim Berners-Lee's vision for the web in general. At that time, it was very, very focused on machine reasoning. An early Scientific American article talked a lot about, it talked about essentially things that sounded like artificial intelligence. It talked about being able to use a mobile device to find data about things that you were trying to do through a network of data on the web and have this device almost make decisions for you. Learn things about the world around it, schedule doctor's appointments based on the specialist you need and the proximity of a doctor to you and the ratings that those doctors are getting and your appointment schedule, your calendar. I think because of that, it was a little bit hard for people to wrap their head around and also to, to catch on, to, to understand and buy into. I myself don't want the web and my mobile device making my doctor's appointments for me. But there's been a pretty big shift since then. And while the uh, idea of machine reasoning is still relevant to the semantic web, it's moved more towards the direction of Thinking, focusing on 
linking things together and describing things. So at the beginning, it was kind of, in general, it was metadata about things that were on the web, documents, so to speak. The same kind of metadata that libraries are used to taking advantage of and providing. But over time, the semantic web sort of started to evolve into this idea of providing metadata about all sorts of things and about the relationships between those things. Which sort of raises the question, well, what are the kinds of things involved? And they're very similar to the kinds of things that libraries describe. We describe documents, quote unquote, books and web pages and the like, but then we also have our authority data, which describes authors and people and concepts, subjects. So I want to give an overview of some of the RDF and semantic web technology terminology um, so that we're I, I'm at least speaking the same language as everyone else because the semantic web community has had this tendency to appropriate words that might be used in a variety of other contexts to mean pretty specific things and make them mean something different. So the first one is the word resource, as in RDF, which stands for the Resource Description Framework. In libraries, we think of resources as the, the, the scholarly materials for academic libraries and the other kinds of materials that we describe, books and documents and articles. But in the semantic web parlance, a resource really is anything and any type of thing. So a person is a resource, and you can have metadata about people. A concept is a resource. From there, you get to classes, which are an abstraction of the types of things that exist in the world. Like if you have metadata about Corey Harper, he's a resource, I'm a resource. The class of thing I am is I'm a person. I'm also a librarian. I'm a technologist. I'm a variety of different things. but you can have multiple classes associated with a thing and hierarchies of those classes. An individual is an instance of that class, so the individual would be Corey Harper again. And then you get into the descriptions of these things. So individuals have properties that, are, that, that describe them. I have a name. So name is a property. It's an attribute of that individual. This sort of leads into the semantic web and linked data idea of a graph, a triple, well, okay, of a triple, which is this notion of a statement about a resource, about any kind of a thing, where you've got on the left-hand side a resource itself, the subject of a short declarative sentence. In the middle, you've got a property, which is the attribute of that individual. It's the verb in the sentence. And on the right, you have an object, the, either another node in the sentence or a string that represents the object of that sentence. So Corey Harper is a librarian, is kind of a, it, it's, a, it's a statement, and it would be represented as a triple in RDF. Graphs are then collections of those statements. And I think this is a really important point to make, because to me, this, is, this was one of the biggest shifts in thinking about the relationship between library data and the way data is represented on the semantic web. Gra graphs are collections of statements, but the operating piece of metadata is the statement itself. It reduces the granularity of things tremendously to individual statements about resources that are then collected. Whereas in most of the library world, and in most of the XML world in general, the, the starting point is a metadata record of some kind that adheres to sort of a complete and, and well-documented metadata schema. Ontology is a collection of classes and properties that are used to build these statements within a particular domain. Again, I used some of these words before, but nodes are the subjects and object, objects in a graph. 
And arcs are the predicates, the verbs, the relationships between those subjects and objects. Nodes then have constraints on them so that in the context of a particular predicate, a particular metadata property, you can only have certain kinds of things on the left-hand side in the subject predict position, which are the domains of that property, and on the right-hand side, the object position, which is the range of those properties. I mentioned before that the object properties, the objects of properties could be strings like a person's name, Corey A. Harper, or the title of a book, which is a textual string, rather than objects in and of themselves. Those are called literals in the semantic web. And then I'm mentioning something briefly here called named graphs, which is, I think, an important concept. And again, I'll talk about this a bit more later. But the idea is that you can take a subset of a graph, a, a collection of triples or statements about a resource or set of resources, label that with a URI, and treat it as if it's a node in order to associate additional metadata with it. So in order to try to sort of illustrate this, I have a brief example about an article I recently wrote for NISO's Information Standards Quarterly. I don't know if you can see the cursor I'm moving around, but since I don't have a pointer, I'm going to use this cursor in order to sort of show you what I mean by all of this. The article is the central node, the thing being described. It has a title. It has an identifier in the form of a DOI. Those are literals. The boxes basically are saying that the thing at the other end of that metadata property is a string. Some of these other properties of the article, the fact that it's part of this journal and it's by this author, the objects of those statements are additional resources. A journal which has its own metadata, the organization who publishes it, their, that organization's location, its title, the person who authored it has a name and a birth date, is employed by another resource, an organization, that then in turn has a name. So moving back to these terminology slides, the resources are the things, the, the ovals in that graph I was showing you. The properties are the arrows between them. And the statements are the, the, the statements made about that metadata. Moving on from that, at a certain point in, I think around, nine, around 2007 or 2008, the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, started to sort of reframe this notion of the semantic web and started talking about something called linked open data. I mentioned before that originally the semantic web was all about artificial intelligence and inference rules to try to guess information about other kinds of things as you pull data in from different places. The linked data movement focuses more on the side of publishing that data and creating those inner relationships without too much of a concern about the, the sort of overblown, in my opinion, artificial intelligence components of it. So linked data really comes down to these four principles. To name the things, the, the, the resources, the nodes in those graphs with URIs to use HTTP, the infrastructure of the web, so that people can look those names up and get something back, get information about that resource by resolving that URI. And then including links to other URIs so that people can discover more things. For reasons I don't fully understand in the semantic web community, that fourth one is often talked about as the follow your nose principle. The ability to just sort of navigate between URIs and find interesting things that are relevant to what it is you're trying to look at. As soon as this linked open data premise was laid out, it started to grow tremendously rapidly. What you're seeing here is a representation of data sources on the web 
that are using the four principles mentioned before and representing metadata about themselves in RDF. On the left-hand side was the original version of this linked data cloud, May 2007. Not too many data sources. A year later, that cloud had blown up to what you're seeing on the right. A year after that, in July 2010, or 2009, not even a year after that, it looked like this. The most recent version of this cloud, from September of the last year, looks like this. All of these are individual sources of data, collections of data, that are published and interlinked to each other using those principles laid out. In this latest version, it's also color-coded, and you'll notice that this color block up here on the right corresponds to publication information. This is the beginning of libraries and library data, as well as publisher data, showing up on the linked data web. In the 2009 version, there was only one library, Libris. This is the union catalog of the uh, National Library of Sweden, representing all of the bibliographic collections of the country of Sweden as a whole. They were the first people in the library world to really start publishing data about themselves. Now we have all of this that's library or library related publication information. The Virtual International Authority file, Library of Congress subject headings, French subject headings, um, subjects from the National Diet Library in Japan, data from the Open Library, and onward and onward. In the slides that will be distributed, this graph is linked, and the version on Richard Signiak's website, each of these bubbles is linked and will take you to the data source in question. So it's really a great place to use to sort of explore what's going on in the linked data world. But just looking briefly at what this data is and what it looks like, in the early 2008 versions of the cloud, there weren't many sources of data. There was a lot of distributed data in a format called friend of a friend, which is essentially a metadata scheme for describing yourself online and the networks of people that you know and organizations that you're involved with. Geonames was another early, early representation, uh, repre RDF representation of data on the web. It was and is information about places, including the time periods that those places were jurisdictions, what kinds of places they are, and what their geographic coordinates are. Music Brains is pretty self-explanatory, and DBpedia is one of the more interesting ones, which I'll get to a little bit in the middle portion of this presentation. Essentially what it is, is an extraction of all of the data in all of the multilingual versions of Wikipedia represented as data rather than as web pages in RDF. Really, really useful source. And in all of these slides, in all of these clouds, it's almost always very, very, very central because it becomes sort of a hub for linking to and from all kinds of other data. After that, though, as the clouds begun to grow, a lot of really interesting sources have been coming online. And if I had hours to give this presentation, I would show you examples of a lot of them. But even just listing examples gives you a sense of the power of what's happening here. Thomson Reuters is publishing a huge amount of information. The New York Times is publishing its topics as RDF. The British Broadcasting Corporation has done a lot of really interesting things with wildlife and with their programs and with a handful of other data sources, making them available in the linked data world. Government data is starting to come online. And as a result, Google and Facebook and some other organizations have really started paying attention to the underlying technologies. Most significantly, though, more and more library and archive and museum data is showing up on the linked data web. I think before I go much further and give examples, I want to take a short pause and find out if there are questions coming in because I know I just went through 
a fair amount of information about the semantic web and linked data in a short period of time. And if folks are new to this, I want to try to cover some questions now. Um, this is a comment more than a question, but maybe it's something that you can address. It says, authority data is actually not a description, but the authority for a controlled vocabulary for subjects and corporate personal and other official names. Are, are you going to talk later on in your presentation, or would you like to talk now about how um, using these triples could transform the information that currently resides in authority data? I will try to address that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, I don't know if I'll address it to the detail that the questioner wants, so let me, let me think about that and see if it can come back up in the Q&A later as well. Okay. Um, a, a brief factual question. What is a URI? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a URI is a broader category of identifiers that are actionable on the web. So we're familiar with URLs, universal resource locators. Those are locators for a document. They're not really tend, we don't tend to think of them as identifiers for that document as well, in part because documents move around a lot on the web. URIs is, are almost a superclass of that. So a URL is a kind of URI, but so is a Perl, and so is a DOI, which may not even be clickable as a URL. It may not be resolvable over HTTP, but it's an identifier for a resource on the web. Okay. Um, is there a way to produce a linked data cloud around a term or organization so that you can get a sense of what's already available? Huh. I will sort of address that in a slide in about 10 minutes when I talk about something called CCAN, which stands for the Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network. OK, um, to follow up on the URI, can you um, define a DOI too? Digital object identifiers are um, heavily used in the publishing industry as identifiers for articles, and then there are some central resolvers that will turn them into URLs. So sometimes when you're searching in a uh, indexing and abstracting service on the web, you get to an article citation, and it will include a DOI, often as a link. And that link is using the identifier and then a resolver that resolves that identifier to try to um, get you to the article that is associated with that with that indexing entry. All right, and one more question, and this relates to how the cloud relates, I think, to physical environment. If there was damage to the Japanese libraries and organizations, um, how would the information that they're putting out there be protected? That's a great question. Um, I think what ends up happening in practice is that it's fairly ad hoc. Um, people who are making heavy use of data find that, similar to how the web works in general, they do caching and proxying of that. So you make a local copy of data that you link to and make heavy use of, and re serve that from your own system rather than every time you have to follow that link to another source of data going back and going to the original source. Um, CCAN, again, which I'll talk about in a little bit, also provides bulk downloads of a lot of data, and I think helps with some of that mirroring and kind of proxying as well. But it's a very good question, and I haven't actually tried to follow links to uh, the National Diet Library subject headings in Tokyo since everything that's been happening, and that, that would actually be worth looking at at some point. So thank you for making me think of that. All right, um, we got one more question here. Can you explain RDF as it relates to linked data? Well, that's in a way supposed to be the entire premise of this presentation. <laughs> but yes, I can try a very short answer. Um, there's some debate about this. When the linked data principles were originally posted, 
by Tim Berners-Lee as a design note on the W3C website, there was no explicit reference to RDF and related W3C technologies. The idea was just use URIs to name things, provide descriptions of them when somebody dereferences that URI, and link to other things. About a year in, the design note was updated to include specific references to RDF as the sort of lingua franca for providing the descriptions of the things that those URIs represent. And in a way that makes a lot of sense because what RDF basically does is it standardizes across domains the way you describe the metadata vocabularies that you use when describing resources. Which sounds a little convoluted, but my what I mean by that is the arcs in the graphs I was showing you before are also links. They're, they're, they're also represented by URIs. And if you follow that, you get metadata about the property. And that metadata is often conveyed in RDF. And if your metadata about other resources is conveyed in RDF, it makes it easy to use the infrastructure of the web as a whole to try to understand what that metadata means. And hopefully as I get into a couple of examples, once I start going again, that might become a little bit more clear. All right, thank you, Corey. Thank you. And let's get going again then. Um, am I presenting again? Yeah, I have been the whole time, I think. Yes. Good, good, thank you, sorry. <laughs> There we go. So I want to talk briefly about Wikipedia and DBpedia and the center of this hub. And then I'll talk about a couple of additional data formats that are floating out or out and around there, about out and about on the web at large, before I segue into the library data for the second half of the presentation. DBpedia is interesting because it interlinks with so many other data sets. Here's just some examples of data sets that are linking to and from Linky, with, with DBpedia along with counts of links between them. This is pretty powerful stuff and it, it, this sort of illustrates how it has become a hub. What, that, what, what the DBpedia folks have done is they've tried to structure, using RDF, the entirety of knowledge as represented in Wikipedia, including the various language scripts. In doing so, they started to build, to build up a, a data model, and a fairly interesting one, because it's a good example of a really ad hoc approach to building a data model which is another way of saying designing an ontology around the things that are in your data that you want to describe. For DBpedia, they based it on Wikipedia's data entry conventions, things that are called info boxes and info box templates. This is the metadata entry format for creating Wikipedia articles, but DBpedia used it as a source for some of the class structure, the kinds of things that are represented in the data, as well as the rest of the ontology, the vocabulary elements, the attributes associated with those things. DBpedia des describes three and a half million things. And those info boxes that it's based on represent kinds of things for up to around a million and a half of the things that DBpedia describes. There's about 50,000 properties, metadata properties, and about 1,200 of them are explicitly defined in the ontology. But talking a little bit more about where this comes from, to me it was really kind of illustrative of understanding the approach that DBpedia took. Because when you're creating a new article on Wikipedia, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of these info boxes, probably tens of thousands, that represent the kind of article that your article is modeled after. 
So this is just the 57 that are associated with the broad category of music, including one for musical artists, which then tells you what, whoops, what important info, but what important pieces of information should be included in the sidebar of articles about musicians. This is what drives the left hand, you, you often see this on the right hand side of almost any Wikipedia article. Information about a person's birth name, other uh, names they've been known as, birth dates, genres of music they perform in, their occupation, their instru instruments, photographs. All of that stuff is laid out in these info box templates. So based on that, DBpedia said, well, those are things that represent metadata about people that are in Wikipedia articles. So they used that to generate these metadata views that are available as RDF to link to and from and to provide useful information. Just to pull up the full version of this, which is not a pretty user interface. Whoops, I didn't want the RDF. I don't want to show you XML on screen. Bear with me, sorry. So this is not meant to be a user interface, but you can kind of get a sense of what metadata is around there, including additional languages, representations of information about Bob Dylan in different scripts even, not all of which I have the fonts on this machine to even display to you right now. This sort of begs the question of what kinds of things are in library metadata. And a long time ago, I pulled together an RDF graph that was based on converting a mark record to a mods record and then using a tool that um, some folks at MIT had developed to try to represent the things that are in that record as an RDF graph. So this giant graph represents one single mark record. And it's not entirely correct because the RDF creation tool that's, that was developed at MIT wasn't developed by a librarian. But I include this slide really just to illustrate the point that Library data is really complicated stuff. We have these rich stores of mark data and mods data. We have really rich controlled vocabularies, lists of codes and lists of terms. And we have the beginnings of a data model in the family of functional requirements, or as I think I heard Karen Coyle call them in a presentation yesterday, the framily, which kind of made me chuckle. There's a lot of then different ways to try to represent that bibliographic data in RDF. And this is something I'm going to talk about a little bit and show you some more examples of in a second. There are ones that are getting heavily used that do not come from the library community. So the bibliographic ontology, BIBO, is a, it's, it's essentially for represent, RDF for representing bibliographic data on the web. It's not as nearly as complex as the library data, but it's increasingly getting used by a lot of tools, including those that are developed in libraries. Similarly, there was an unofficial version of the functional requirements of, for bibliographic rep records represented in, for, in RDF not that long ago, actually for about the last five years. Now IFLA is officially publishing their representation of Ferber as RDF, and I think it's going to help us sort of move our model into the semantic web world and help move library data more effectively out onto the web at large so that it can interoperate with folks who are using these other standards. As I mentioned before, there are just countless sources of archival and library and museum data starting to show up online as linked data. The first was the Swedish Union catalog, and around that same time, the Library of Congress subject headings getting published, as well as other Library of Congress data like the newspaper digitization project and the website for it developed by LC's Office of Strategic Initiatives. 
The German National Library is now publishing RDF representations of authors from their name authority file, as is the Virtual International Authority file, VF. The Hungarian National Library has now published names and subjects and bibliographic data following a model similar to what Libris was doing. The British Library is publishing data. Europeana is a really interesting cross-European Union initiative to represent all sorts of color, cultural heritage information from archives, from museums, from libraries, as RDF on the web. And similarly, there's something called the Linked Open COPAC for Archives Hub, a project coming out of UCOLN and the JISC in the UK to represent archival data as RDF. I think this is a good time to move to some additional examples and talk a little bit about what some of these look like. There we go. So the Libris data, which was the first to come out there, and I am going to show you RDF now, so I apologize in advance for that, but I think it's really useful to see what the actual metadata looks like here. And I apologize for the fact that I just kind of know how to munch these URLs, but once I figure out which of these browser tabs I use in the presentation, I'll add a link that to the I'll add links to them all to the presentation that gets distributed. One of the interesting things here is that for ISBNs, they used the bibliographic ontology. Because there was no and it really is no other way right now to represent, there's no field for ISBN out in the RDF world other than that published by Bibo. A lot of the examples I showed you on that slide are using the bibliographic ontology to represent some of this data. The National Library of Hungary is doing the same thing as Sweden in this regard. And an initiative that I didn't mention before called the, where'd it go? linked LCCN, which is a wrapper on top of the, lib the LCCN, the Library of Congress control number service from LC, that exposes that data as linked data. It's also using the bibliographic ontology for certain things like LCCNs. But it's starting to use RDA elements too. And this is when I'm finally with 20 minutes left in this session, going to start talking a little bit about resource description and access, the topic of this entire webinar series. RDA, in addition to its representation in MARC, has an initiative going on to try to represent the hundreds upon hundreds of properties including statement of responsibilities, statements of responsibility, strings that include the author information and the role that they've played in a human readable way. All of the stuff that we have currently in MARC records is folks are making an effort to map that out to the semantic web. Authority data is kind of starting to do the same thing. Wow, I went into bib data before I meant to. So I'm going to take a step back and talk briefly about authority data in the hopes of answering the question that uh, came up during the Q&A at the middle as well. We all know the benefits of library controlled vocabularies, longest, biggest being the reputation we have and the maturity that our vocabularies have. So now we're starting to be able to represent those using another RDF vocabulary called SCOS, the Simple Knowledge Organization System, which starts figuring out, managing the, the relationships like primary topic between an RDF document, a RDF document representing a resource like a web page or a book, and an RDF document representing something like a person or a subject. It also manages the alternative kinds of labels that we have in the cross-references in our controlled vocabularies and starts publishing them onto the web in a way that fits into this larger 
network of data being exposed on the web. Lots of vocabularies are starting to do this now as well. Uh, thesaurus of economics out of Germany, the French subject headings, Swedish subject headings, Japanese subject headings, uh, De Dewey Decimal Classification, name authority files coming out of the Library of Congress and other places, and there's, there's many, many, many more. That's not where I meant to go, my apologies. This is where I went and meant to go. This data is also slowly but steadily being made available as RDF. And right now, people are still trying to figure out how to manage pre-coordinated strings. So right now, there's not much in the way of cross-references here because this particular heading string doesn't actually have an authority record behind it. But if it did, which neither of those are going to, it would also be represented to have its cross-references laid out and its source information laid out as RDF. I want to start trying to go through my remaining slides a bit quicker because I am getting a little tight on time. I want to talk briefly, and I already mentioned this in the context of this piece of data here and these RDA elements that are showing up, Resource description and access is starting to move the formal and complex library data into this space. But all of our focus so far has been on RDA as represented in MARC. And a lot, we, we've in many ways been very critical of it because it doesn't seem like a huge shift in some ways, and in other ways it's a tremendously large shift and maybe not worth the effort that we're putting into it in the context of our MARC-based systems. But I think what's really, really interesting about RDA is the representation of this data as RDF-friendly, link data-friendly metadata, so that our descriptions of things can more freely interoperate on the web while retaining the, their expression of the complexity that they have Within, within our internal systems. RDA is trying to do that by registering classes and properties and controlled vocabularies for the RDA element set in a metadata registry. That work is being done primarily by a Diane Hillman and Karen Coyle and members of this Dublin Core Metadata Initiative slash RDA task group, but there are there is support for it from the Joint Steering Committee and from ALA and from the Dublin Core community. Talk, I, I can't say the word metadata registry without saying what it is. The idea of a metadata registry is providing an interface for managing vocabularies and providing services over those vocabularies. And I've got some screenshots to show you what that looks like for RDA. And I also wanted to note that IFLA, primarily due to the work of Gordon Dunsire, formerly from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, is doing the same kind of work to formally represent Ferber and the rest of the functional requirement family of, of uh, data model kind of specifications, as well as the informal data model behind our existing MARC record, the International Standard for Bibliographic Description, or ISBD. Just to show you what that looks like, this is a list of, this is the beginning of a list of the 400 and some odd specific individual metadata properties that are represented in RDA, shown as RDF. I'm not showing you the RDF, but they're publishing them as RDF so that they can be used on the semantic web. Similarly, there are things like the controlled vocabularies, the pick lists for certain of those 3-3x fields. This, in this example, it's the vocabulary that drives content type. Even more interesting, within those, for example, cartographic data set as a content type in RDA, the 
Germans have gotten involved in this to provide translations of the preferred label and the scope note for the controlled vocabulary entry term. They're doing the same thing for the properties themselves. So this creates a really easy framework for starting to make a lot of this kind of metadata definitions inter, um, multilingual. I wanted to mention briefly and show a, shot, a screenshot of the beginning of a list of the 200 or so um, ISBD properties that are showing up in here as well. And then sort of mentioned that RDA is an attempt at realizing Ferber. And I probably should have gone into some detail on what Ferber is, but I assumed that cataloger audience is going to have a good sense of the functional requirements for bibliographic records. And the group one entities within Ferber, the, that, that hierarchy of work, manifestation, expression, item. This is the first time that a library metadata schema has started trying to build on what that looks like. The important thing I want you to note here, though, is that in all likelihood, we're not going to be using MARC for this. We're going to be moving in a direction away from the MARC record because a lot of the power of RDA and Ferber isn't really expressible in MARC. It's not really expressible in the idea of a metadata record at all. It best is expressed as a series of relationships between intellectual works, their expressions, and the physical published manifestations of them. There are still a lot of open problems with this. The biggest one, to my mind, being that RDA officially is saying that these properties have very strictly defined domains and ranges. Remember I said at the beginning when I was laying out the terminology for this presentation, domains are the kinds of things that can be in the subject position of a simple sentence about a thing. This book is by William Shakespeare. The book is the, the, the type of thing in that book slot is the domain of the is by or is authored by property. Its range in this case is a person because people and corporate bodies and entities like that are the authors. Forcing that level of constraint on the RDF representation of RDA is potentially problematic because it makes it hard to interoperate with data that don't really make distinctions between, for example, manifestations and expressions and don't really think about things in terms of the breakdown of the Ferber world. As in a, a way of getting past that, the folks in the doing the metadata registry work for, this, for RDA have unofficially defined these generalized properties that correspond to where you have publisher of the, of the manifestation, there's a more general RDA publisher property which is sort of above the publisher of the manifestation property and doesn't require you to know that you have a manifestation as a pre prerequisite. This is similar to some constraints that are artificially included in DCMI on the range side, but I think the domain constraints are the more important ones. I bring up the range constraints because I jokingly referred to these things as free range metadata. The uh, idea being that the less you constrain your domains and ranges, the more interoperable your metadata is going to be with people who may not have the same view of the world that you do. These were my very poor RDF graph people, and they are now out in the field with free-range chickens. I'm sorry for the bad humor in that slide. What the whole purpose of this, though, is to try to better align the RDA vocabularies with things like the bibliographic ontology. And I think these are a lot of the open questions that we're still trying to work through. In terms of those open questions, I think it's really good that the library community 
is starting to engage in a lot of this process and trying to even start to influence the way semantic web data works outside of the library world. The reason this matters so much to me is because our descriptions no longer are by themselves on the web. There are a lot of other sources of metadata. I mean, I, I've been watching the Twitter feeds coming through from South by South, South by Southwest in Austin this past week, and everything seems to be about data and metadata. Or maybe I just see everything through my metadata glasses. There tends to be, though, there's a lot of additional data coming out and about, and it makes sense for us to try to pull our data into that increasingly distributed data environment. And that's one of the main goals of linked data. By treating these kind of resources as things themselves and giving them URIs so that we can connect our descriptions of them to other people's descriptions. As I said, there's a lot of ongoing work in this area. It's sort of a work in progress including the idea of records in linked library data that aggregate statements from graphs into named graphs so that we can say things about, for example, the provenance of particular information, where it's coming from, which helps us understand its validity. There's a lot of issues related to trying to create alignments and interoperability between vocabularies. And there's a lot of general questions about metadata interoperability in our world and elsewhere. Some of the groups that are looking at these things include an incubator group at the W3C that's collecting use cases, as well as an elect LIDA linked library data interest group that we just got started officially this uh, past month, actually. And we'll be meeting at ALA Annual. We don't know the dates yet, but it will be in the program. The time is 10.30 Sunday morning, but we don't know the place. It'll be in the program. IFLA is creating a similar interest group. There's a variety of other places. Oh, I never did get to mention CCAN. Um, you can follow up with me online after that, because I want to go back to questions while we still have time. If your questions aren't kind of covered, you can get in touch with me via email or phone or Twitter. Those are probably the best ways to try to reach me. And All right. Hi, Corey. Um, we've gotten some questions that I, I think people are grappling with what exactly a, a catalog would be um, when it's not record-based. Um, and one of the questions is, I haven't seen any examples of non-MARC RDA. Do you have any examples that you would recommend? Unfortunately, I don't think there are any examples yet. And I think this is part of the problem. Um, at NYU, we're starting to think about this in the context of uh, pulling together information about disparate digital collections and objects in those digital collections. And basically what we're using RDA for is those places where terms available in, in ontologies like Dublin Core and Bibo are not specific enough to represent what we want to represent. So this example I was showing you here is sort of a mixture of Dublin Core information and Dublin Core representations of that metadata, metadata using the bibliographic ontology, and then for those cases where who but a librarian has this idea of a title proper. That's something that we need to provide, and our metadata specifications are going to give us the ability to do that. So it's really more about mixing together the various vocabularies that are useful in order to create views of data about resources. Um, another question that we have is, are you saying that eventually catalogers will be creating 
sort of records like this with URIs instead of our traditional bibliographic records? And how do you see this information being stored? Well, I'm not, I'm, I think there are a lot of different possibilities for that. I think it's possible to actually store the data as URIs within the framework of something that looks similar to MARC. I mean, I guess part of the way I would answer that is if you dig deep into almost any of the modern integrated library systems, the underlying data is rarely stored as MARC. MARC is the transmission format and it's become our editing format and it's become our display format, unfortunately, or at least unfortunately to my mind. But the underlying data, the indexes that you use to search things, aren't necessarily stored as MARC. So there could be a variety of different ways to store this. There are systems out there for storing the raw RDF triples. I think it's more likely that the information is going to be mapped into databases because RDF is actually very similar to the kind of relational data model used in most modern day databases. And we could store this information in, for example, Oracle or SQL Server or any other kind of database and then expose it as linked data on the web. Okay. We got a comment to follow up to the last question that says that the Library of Congress has some non-marked bibliographic records cataloged using RDA, which are available on the US RDA test site. As MARC, though, right? Um, I don't know, but I'm just uh, throwing it out there for people. Thank you. We have several questions. Um, wondering if you could provide some recommended readings and yes. maybe this is something that you could um, send out via email? Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Um, I can pull together sort of an introductory bibliography on some of these things. And uh, some of it would be blog posts and web posts, but there's a lot of good scholarly literature out there as well. Um, and then a question that says, wouldn't it be interesting if there were an authority control vendor that cr could provide linked data in one's catalog? Oh, wow. I'm not I sure if there's any work in that regard. Well, I think the closest thing we're seeing to that is the work that OCLC is doing in cooperation with a number of national libraries with the Virtual International Authority file. Um, because that's pulling together data from a variety of different national libraries authority records, merging them and trying to do some matching so that there are different um, representations of the same information and then exposing that as linked data. And they're not really doing it as a product because they're doing it, it's freely available. OK. Um, and a question, is there anybody out there who's starting to offer hands-on training? Um, what kind of tools are available if you want to start publishing links data? This is a great question. And I was just having a uh, back and forth with Karen Coyle at, about exactly this thing. I think we're ready to start doing that. And I think the biggest challenge, challenge is finding presenters for workshops and webinars that can get into the hands-on stuff. Um, I think we might consider this uh, something for the newly formed joint LIDA and ELECT's uh, interest group to tackle. So if you're planning on attending uh, ALA annual in New Orleans, please do come to that meeting because we would like to hear about exactly what kinds of hands-on training people need and what we can be doing there. In addition, there's, a, there's some tutorial-like information on the web that I'll be sure to include in the recommended reading section. All right. Thank you, Corey. Um, I'm going to just take over the screen one more time to um, conclude the 
webinar. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to describe and explore the benefits of um, linked data for library. We do have one more additional webinar as part of our spring RDA webinar series, and that's on April 6th. Irina Kandarasheva and Mark Wilson will be presenting on preparing copy catalogers for RDA. Additional webinars on RDA are being planned for the late summer and fall, and information on these webinars will be available on the ELEX website. We hope you found today's session useful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. The comments that are received are reviewed by the ELEX Continuing Education Committee and used to plan additional continuing education offerings. Information about all ELEX webinars are featured on the ELEX homepage, the link there. New webinars and continuing education events are continuously being developed, so please check there frequently for new information. We welcome suggestions for webinars and other continuing education opportunities. You can suggest webinar topics through the link that's on the screen. Before we sign off, I would like to thank Melissa Delfino for providing technical support for today's webinar. She and her colleagues on the Continuing Education Committee's Technical Support Subcommittee make it possible that we can present these webinars so smoothly. We sincerely appreciate your attendance today, and we hope that you'll join us again in the future for webinars on RDA and other topics. Thank you.